morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Morning. Morning. It's good to see all your smiling faces. Um, nobody put a gun to your head to make you come here today, right? Um, and nobody held a gun to keep you out. Be thankful for the freedom that you still have. Amen. 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 You know, um, I don't know if you realize what's going on in Canada, but there's some serious things happening as we speak. Um, 50,000 trucks have headed to Ottawa and 500,000 people as of yesterday. I don't know what's going on today, but uh, some serious action happening up there. Ottawa, Canada? Ottawa, mm -hmm. yes. The capital of <coughs> Canada. So, um, freedom is being eroded. <laughs> and this is the world we live in today. The discussion I want to have is basically about the Sabbath, and, I, and I'm not here just to preach to you guys today. I would like maybe some mics, Donald, if uh, people want to interact. I'm open to that, more like a, a, a Sabbath school atmosphere type of thing, okay? So uh, I'm not going to push off any comments if people want to talk. I'm more than welcome to uh, allow that to happen. I think that um, many of us have good experiences with the Sabbath and understand things on a level that maybe other people don't, and they can share their experience, and you know we can sweeten the pot, so to speak. The Sabbath is the most beautiful day of the whole week. You know, um, we rest in Jesus all week long, but we come on the Sabbath. To celebrate that rest. Amen. Right? Yes. We don't come to be saved. <laughs> okay? That's not what happens. Although people are accused of that. Um, whatever. Let people think what they may. Um, I'm going to read a little bit more. And as we get into this, you know, I, I may spur some discussion. Or if you guys, if somebody wants to say something, feel free. Raise your hand. We got some mics out here. Um, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, with that little statement there, God has set a precedence, right? The evening and the morning were the sixth day, right? So where does the seventh day begin? Evening. In the evening, right? This is the Bible speaking. Not Ray. I have no authority. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. If you follow me, you're a mess. Okay? Because I'm not the guy to follow. Jesus is the guy to follow. These are his words. These are 66 love letters written to each one of you. Specifically to you. About Amen. the one who loves you beyond my even comprehension of the word love. Because I don't even believe I've begun to understand it yet. I don't even think I've scratched the surface. Although I adore my wife who's not here today because she's tender to other people. And that's just what wonderful ladies do. Some men too, but I just don't have that gene. I'm not a good caretaker. I mean, I would do it if I had to, but... Just not my thing. Anyways, as we go on, the heavens and the earth were finished in all the host of them. Thus that. And on the seventh day, I'm reading from two and two, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested. Do you hear that? On the seventh day, from all his work which he had made, and then in verse 3 it says, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Do you hear where the blessing comes? The blessing comes after the rest. You see? He didn't just declare it. He showed them. And then he, he sanctified it. Do you hear it? Well, what was Adam and Eve's first day? 
right here. This is it. So God has created everything. They're the last of creation. The crowning act of creation is woman, wow man, right? Because God made man and then he made wow man. And there it is. And what is their first thing that God does with them? He shows them that, listen, I have done this all. Right? He's showing them how to Shabbat, how to rest in Him. Why did God create man? <coughs> For what reason? Well, to have a place to dwell. To a dwelling place. Right. He made God as a dwelling place. I, if you want to turn to Isaiah 66, I'd like you to hold your finger in Genesis. Stay there. Don't move your place, even though it's easy to find. Isaiah 66 says... Thus says the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest, God is saying? For all those things hath my hand made and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. There's an awesome awe and respect there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. You see, but, but what I want to focus on is verse 1. Where is the house that ye build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? For God, it's supposed to be in us. We are living, walking sanctuaries. <laughs> this is what we are called to be. And this is the ultimate of what God is looking for in man. Okay? Um, I, I want to turn to Genesis 3 and 15. If you go there. The Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, if you look up this word enmity in your Bible... It's Ava. Ava. Okay? It means hatred. Hatred. God has put this supernatural hatred for sin in each and every one of us. But the Bible also says that we are what? Sin. Right? Because of our nature. So who we are naturally is bent against God. Naturally born, we have a hatred towards God. And we're in league with the devil. That's who our nature is. But God has supernaturally said that he's put this enmity in us. This hatred for the evil. So is capable for us to have the mind of Christ by not giving to the flesh. See, the devil has to get into the, get into the mind through the flesh to the mind. But God has given us this enmity that we could have this mind of Christ and win this battle. Because when we have the mind of Christ, God is in his temple. Amen. You hear me? Yeah. He is in his temple. And when that temple gets set together, it's game over for the devil. It's done. He has been declared a defeated enemy, but God has not rectified this yet. And it's not because he's lacking. Because we are failing to give him the place that he desires. And thank God for the Sabbath. Because this Sabbath is a sign of this rest. Amen. And this hope that we have. Um, let's turn to Exodus. Anybody that would like to comment? You're more than open. I mean, raise your hand and you can say something. And uh, you won't throw me off. Um, Exodus 31, and I want to begin in verse 13. 
And this is, um, I have a little heading in my Bible above verse 13. It says, exhortation to keep the Sabbath. So I'm just going to begin at verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and and you throughout all your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Okay? So sign, that word for sign in the Bible is oath. O-T-H. Okay? A signal, a flag, a beacon, an omen, evidence, mark, a miracle. That's what this sign is. That's what the Bible says, okay? And to sanctify, it says he is the one who sanctifies you. Sanctify, that word, if you look it up, is kodash. It means to make clean, to set apart, to dedicate, to hollow, to purify. These are the things that God is longing to do if we are willing. If we are willing. You know, you, you, you talked in here a little bit about the, the uh, story time about things that you're thankful for. I'm thankful for heat. I like heat. I'm glad that I live in Florida. You know, uh, if I was outside, I, I wouldn't be afraid of freezing to death. If I had to live outside, I think I'd be further south. I would have to heed the warnings of falling iguanas, you know, but at least I'm not going to freeze to death. Yeah. Um, I generally like the air conditioner to kick on, but today, when I felt the warm air, I was very happy. It just made me feel good, like Brother Jonathan said. Anyways, um, I want to continue on here. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. What does the word perpetual mean? means without end. Without end. Okay. Has the Sabbath ended? I don't think so. Let us turn to uh, Isaiah 66 again. No, it isn't 66 that I want. Turn to uh, 58. Fifty-eight and verse six. Just let me know when you're there. Yeah. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, that thou hide not thy, thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here am I, if thou puttest forth the finger. Wait a minute. If thou takest away from the midst of thee the, the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. Let's turn down, let's just jump down to 13. If thou turn away thy foot 
from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and to feed and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So I want to ask you, I mean, as a church, I think we do good as a whole, right? I mean, we help a lot of people, right? We have a lot of ministries that we do here, right? Yeah. So, why is the church not filled up? Why isn't that overflowing? I mean, we're here doing the right thing on the right day, right? We're serving the one true God, correct? Yeah. What's the problem? Mary Jane. Well, I hear action. Hang on, hang on. Let's, let's get a mic because we got some people that can't hear. <laughs> I was just thinking that perhaps it's our actions ourselves in how we reflect to others that perhaps we're not showing what a delight the Sabbath is. Mm -hmm. If we're not showing that, why would people desire it? Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Good point. And the Spirit of Prophecy says in Health and Daily Living that the greatest, and I'm paraphrasing it, the greatest thing we can show as far as the gospel is concerned, is to be a loving, lovable Christian. Amen. Otherwise, you saying that you love God and not being loving and lovable to others, saying you love God and showing up on the right day, mm. but not showing that, it's mm. pure hypocrisy. Mm. Uh. Amen. Amen. I'll take care of my own wife, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I grew up in a Christian home and I did not know about Sabbath until I met me, Dennis Holder and he invited me to church and I'm so thankful that he did and I think a lot of people don't know about the Sabbath they think that going to church is on a Sunday you go to Sunday school and most people grew up in a Christian home under those um, guidelines or whatever you want to call it. Not guidelines, but learning. Traditions. Okay. And the other thing I found out is that a lot of people thought that Seventh-day Adventists were this was, um, oh, what, what am I thinking of? Like, no, what, um, what was it? Was what? Cold. No, no, they thought it was, what was, was the people that don't celebrate Christmas oh, yeah. and birthdays. Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Yes, because when I would say I was um, <coughs> Seventh-day Adventist, they said, oh, so you're the ones don't, that don't celebrate Christmas and your birthdays. And I said, no, that's Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> And I also, and then they said, um, Seventh Day Adventists are the ones that don't open their windows and you can't see out of the church. I said, no, that's Jehovah Witness. So a lot of people thought that Seventh Day Adventist was actually the Jehovah Witness. That's what I came across. Gotcha. So um, I thank Dennis. I thank the church family. Um, I am glad that I am Seventh-day Adventist. Um, it was a, a learning for me, and I'm so thankful. So I thank God, um, and I'm glad I've learned all about God and uh, so, uh, um, having our worship on the seventh day, which is Seventh-day Adventist, I mean, which is Sabbath. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you, everybody, for listening. Well, I appreciate what Donna said about people's misconceptions mm -hmm. about who we are. And when I first became Adventist, I would share with people, and I had one friend said, Oh, I know the Adventist. You're the ones who worship Ellen White. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Just a quick testimony. The first time we stepped foot into a Adventist church was with my son Dan here. We that happened because he moved north and we heard he had a call, so we came up to get him out of the call. But the we first started keeping the Sabbath by we didn't really go over to keeping the Sabbath, we were just going to church when he went to church. But I noticed that on Friday evening, I forgot about the week. I forgot about the week and all the stresses thereof. And it's like, and just a, just a modest feeling, I'll be able to look back and say, the Lord was blessing me for keeping the Sabbath, even on the first times when I did not understand. Amen. Anybody else? I was brought up in the church. They turned it out of there, Joseph. Oh, on the I was brought up in the church. So my thinking as a little girl or a child was that everybody else was wrong and we were right. So it depends on how you're brought up and your mindset. Well, I think that, go ahead, brother. The direct answer to your question, though, Satan has a tremendous counterfeit out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Friday, a third of the world worships on Friday, third of the, you know, the rest of it kind of worships on Sunday. So he has counterfeits out there. And that's why we're on full, is because he makes it very pleasant for the counterfeits to, to remain active. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, with all this being said, it doesn't matter what I think. Okay? And it doesn't matter what you think. Mm -hmm. It matters what God thinks. And in Hebrews, yeah, what he thinks and what he says. In Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Right? Okay. I mean, I change not. And in Malachi 3, 6, he says, I change not. Yes, sister. Okay, so your question was, why is our church not full right now? And I think that in our bulletin, one of the quotes that Ricky put in here actually kind of answers that question. And I'm just going to read a little bit out of it. Sure. And it says, Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. To meet the conditions existing at the time when darkness covers the earth, that would be now, and gross darkness covers the people, the Church of God has been commissioned to cooperate with God in shedding abroad the light of Bible truth. <laughs> To those who seek to do their part faithfully as bearers of precious light is given the assurance, the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. And I think that as a church, as a whole, we have not waken up from our Laodicean um, state. And... When we do, and when we start surrendering ourselves daily to God to be that Christian that's walking about, talking with the normal people of everyday life, you know, at our work, in our family, at our job, instead of like, you know, the typical evangelism that we think of as, I'm going to go pass out tracts, or we're going to hold an evangelistic series, this is just the daily life of a Christian, the daily family life, <laughs> going to work, and just interacting and walking humbly with our God, I think that's going to be what starts to attract people to us and to the life that we have, and they're going to see that, and they're going to want what we have, and then our churches are going to start to fill up, because coming to church and worshiping God is going to be the result of them, first of all, knowing who God is through us, and then wanting that in their lives. Amen. So I think that's how our church will eventually fill up. Okay, the question you asked was why we think our church is not filled up. And I, as I was here thinking about it, I was thinking about the day of Pentecost. And you know, when these disciples get together, they started praying and praying. And, you know, and you know, God has left us with the Holy Spirit. And you know, if we lack the Holy Spirit in our church, then the church can't grow because that's what. 
grow in church. And as we can see, that those days when they pray, we got thousands of people joining the church because the Holy Spirit was with them. You know, so if we lack the Holy Spirit, then our church won't grow. And if we have the Holy Spirit, we don't have to go out there and be a witness. Because you know why? That's what you always said, the roof will be blowing off this church. Right. And people would want to know what's going on over there. Why are those people so happy? What's going on? Yeah. Every day the parking lot is full, overflowing. We have in the convention or something over there, we have it. You know, so we don't have to worry about, we just have to make sure what we're doing is right with God. Yeah. His Holy Spirit just yeah. works with us. Amen. The upper room experience is what he's talking about. Full of the Holy Spirit. And everyone is attracted to you. Because they're attracted to God. And that's the key. It's not us trying to make something happen. It's us surrendering ourselves to God. Because all we can give is our will. But God, God forces nothing. He's, he's laid out, this is the way, walk ye in it. Yes, sister. Um, I want to say that it's the love of God. That's what I keep reading over and over and over. It's the love of God in me that I can share with the person in the grocery store or wherever it is. That love attracts another person. It's not how, how, I mean, I'm okay, reverting back to the olden days of how long my skirt is or whatever. You know, I mean, it's, it's the love of, it's what God has done for me in my life, how he's changed my life, that I can share that story with somebody else and, maybe, and their heart will be touched. It's what God has done for me that I want to share with somebody else. And, um... To me, that's that's letting my light shine, and that's um, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want my life to shine for Jesus, to be a reflection of His love, because it's love, it's God's love, it's His Holy Spirit that changes a person, His grace, and I need to show that to others. I need to show that. I want to show that. I don't need to show it. I want it. I want it to be in me. Not a, a, like a conscious, okay, I need to share the love of Jesus today. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. It's, it's you're talking about agape <laughs> love. You're talking about something that you're not capable of. Something that God gives you yes. to give. Yes. But it's for everyone. Right. It's Absolutely. for everyone. And that's what touches people. It's the love of Jesus. Amen. And Amen. I don't know. I, I agree with Olivia. And to me, that's like being on fire. That's a, a church, a praying church, a loving church is yes. on fire right. for God. And that's when the neighbors will see, you know, what's, go what's going on over there, you know. Um, and we'll be out at the neighbors. We'll be out searching them, seeking them out, you know, um, sharing this love that we have. Well, if we're led by the Spirit, we're going to be in the right place at the right time. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. Yes, Ms. Tarsia. That is the key. I like the point that the brother said about the Holy Spirit, and then I like the um, the brother in the front that said about the upper experience. And uh, praise God for those thoughts. Um, I have another question on top of your question. Why are South American and Latino churches outside this country packed and full? every single Sabbath, every single Wednesday, and not in North America. Now, I bring that up because I wasn't raised Seventh-day Adventist. And when I came to this church, I was in the United States. So when I went back and I learned what Seventh-day Adventists are doing out there compared to here, I was shocked. Now, the brother said the upper room experience. Your question was, why isn't the church full? I am more worried about why aren't we filled with the Holy Spirit? 
What is the message that we are giving today they are bringing people in instead of numbers, but message that will keep them out? And I'm talking about people inside our church. Yeah.